So thanks everyone for joining us in day three of this workshop and I'm going to be moderating today. We're going to start off with uh, Ben, who's going to talk to us about type C webs. Great, Take thanks very much. Thanks, Ann. It's a pleasure to be here, of course. Thanks for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to be talking about joint work with uh, Elijah Bodish, David Rose, and Logan Tatham. Um, and what we do in this, uh, in this paper, which just showed up on the archive uh, yesterday or the day before, um, is we give a presentation by generators and relations of uh, representations of SP2N or the quantum group of SP2N, so type C, um, which encodes all the morphisms between tensor products of fundamental representation. And you see right here the answer. So this is a, a monoidal category. I'm using the usual diagrammatic description where a sequence of, of, of dots on a line represents a, uh, an object, in this case, a representation of SP2N. So this sequence down here would be the kth fundamental representation times tensor the first rep fundamental representation. And this diagram would represent a morphism from the bottom to the top. So this would be a map from the k tensor first to the k plus first fundamental representation. And so it turns out that all morphisms between tensor products of fundamental representations are generated by compositions and tensor products of sort of the, the self-duality map uh, the fact that um, the the fact that LK the K fundamental rep is self dual says that there's an, a map from LK tensor it's dual to the trivial representation, and and it's also generated by these morphisms here. I'll talk about those a little bit more later. And um, these cups and caps allow you to twist these trivalent vertices around, so that you could talk about a trivalent vertex oriented in a different way. And the first relation says that this category is pivotal, which says that you can just Isotopy, uh, isotopy classes of diagrams all represent the same morphism. So that's what pivotal means. And in this case, the fact that I was able to eliminate orientations means that it's naturally self-dual with respect to the pivotal structure, which we won't talk about. Um, and here are the rest of the relations. And here they are, they fit on one slide, which is nice. Um, so most of them are actually pretty straightforward. Uh, the dimension of the first fundamental representation is what the dimension of the first fundamental representation is. So if you set n equal to one, this would be 2n, which is the standard representation of sp2n. Sorry, is it q equal to one? Um, and the only complicated one is this one right here. Um, and of course, there is no m plus first fundamental representation or negative first fundamental representation. So um, so these strands just symbolize the zero. Any picture with one of these strands inside it is the zero diagram. That, that sort of applies to the, the k equals m case of this relation. So there is the presentation. And sort of there's not much more to say. Uh, so thanks very much for <laughs> just sorry, bad, bad joke. Um, so uh, OK, so what, what is the context of this result? So um, in, in 2014, this uh, paper of Caddis, Kamnis, or Morrison came out based on Morrison's PhD work in the 2000s. Um, so they construct this category of type A webs. They do the same thing for, for GLN and for SLN. And they give a generators and relations description of this category fund, which I'm calling fund, which is the sort of full subcategory of all representations whose objects are tensor products of fundamental. Um, jumping ahead here, people in this in this special year care about these things because fundamental representations are tilting and type A, and their tensor products are tilting, and every tilting is a direct sum and of one of these tensor products. So if you understand this category, you can formally add item potents and, and, and take sum ands to get the category of tilting objects. Um, that is assuming that we can describe this over arbitrary specializations and not just over the field, over, over the, over in the genericness. Um, so my notation is that V is gonna be the standard representation of GLN until it switches later and becomes a standard representation of SP2N. Uh, this is the Q deformation, which is the standard representation. And of course, the standard representation of GLN is N-dimensional. So I, my basis is gonna be parameterized by the numbers from one to N. Um, the other fundamental representations are just the exterior powers of the standard representation. And so a basis for the exterior power can be parameterized by subsets of, of this set from one to n. You know, the subset one, two would correspond to E1 wedge E2 in the usual sense. 
um, subsets, of course, of size i if you're interested in the ith exterior. So it turns out that there's some very nice GLN intertwiners between exterior products coming from the fact that the exterior algebra is an algebra. So we have a wedge product, um, which takes the ith exterior and the jth exterior to the i plus jth. It's just multiplication in the exterior algebra. And on bases, uh, we know how to take wedge products, uh, but then you might have to reorder them, which introduces some sign based on how, you, how these sets shuffle past each other, or you get zero if you, for the same reason, you get zero when you wedge things together. Um, meanwhile, there's also a co-wedge, which people don't talk about as often, but it's a, also a pretty standard thing. Um, in this case, it takes a set and finds all the ways to split it up into two smaller sets of the appropriate size, um, and again, has a sign based on how you shuffle. So this is a description of certain GLN intertwiners between exterior powers. What about the Q deformation? Uh, once you pass to the quantum group, it's not a um, symmetric monoidal category anymore. Uh, so it's a little bit harder to talk about exterior uh, products of V, but actually one can still talk about it. There's a paper of Berenstein and Zwicknagel which defines these quantum exterior products. Um, and in fact, the LIs are quantum exterior products. Um, regardless, you don't have to know what that means um, because you could just use the same parameterization of the basis and there's sort of very natural Q deformations of the formulas above, which tell you everything you need to know about these intertwiners. Any questions? So what Morrison did in his thesis was to sort of start studying these by encoding, encoding them with diagrams. Um, so you could also say that he defined a category by generators and relations if you want. Um, and to say that he encoded morphisms with diagrams is to say that he has this functor that tells you this diagram represents this morphism of GLN. Um, so again, a, a, tensor pro, a, a sequence of dots on a line represents a tensor product of fundamental representations. And these two Trivalent vertices represent the wedge product and the co-wedge co-product. Um, and and I, we wrote down formulas for those above. And so Morrison explored these and he found lots of relations that are satisfied. So for example, here's the bygone relation, which says that if I compose these two morphisms, co-wedge and then wedge, I'm getting a multiple of the identity. And this multiple is a quantum binomial. And it's, it's really easy to see why this is true from the formulas above. If you apply this to a basis element, first you, you co-wedge it to take a sum with some sign or some power of Q of all ways to split it into an S and a T of the appropriate size. And then those exactly merge back to the exact same EU um, with some appropriate powers of, of Q or signs. Um, all the signs cancel out exactly. Uh, and, so, and so you're just going to get some linear combination of powers of Q or at 2 equals 1, which is what I wrote down here. You're just going to get a binomial coefficient based on the number of terms in the sum. So all, all of these relations that I'm writing down have like a very combinatorial description. This relation is basically saying, oh, this coefficient is the number of ways to take a set of size i plus j and decompose it into a set of size i and a set of size j. It, 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 it may be some coefficient in a linear combination, but it has real intrinsic meaning. So there's, there's other, other relations that he found. Associativity is sort of fairly obvious since we have an associative algebra. Um, the fact that the, there's no exterior powers higher than the nth exterior power of an n-dimensional vector space. And then this funky square fop relation, which is by far the most complicated, but also it can be described as some sort of like, all right, I'm bringing a set of size r over and a set of size s back. What's the size of the intersection? I could have not brought over that intersection and that's what these terms represent. It, it's all something combinatorial. The problem that Morrison had though is that he didn't know that these were enough relations. So he defined a category of webs with, with all these relations, but he had, you know, you can make a gazillion diagrams out of trivalent vertices, glue them together in many, many different ways. And it, it wasn't obvious that um, imposing these relations would allow you to simplify the diagrams until you got down to a category of the right size. Um, in fact, he had a lot more relations. He didn't know if he would need, he, he had more relations, extremely complicated ones called the Kekulé relations. And it was, wasn't really clear um, how to deduce those relations from these and, or whether that was enough either. 
Um, we now know that they're redundant, but actually there's still no um, derivation of many of his Kekulé relations from these simple relations, as far as I know. Uh, people just, they were just able to prove the theorem without it, so there's some complicated way to do it. It's a tricky question, and this is the, one of the questions I want to talk about in this talk, is how you prove something like this. So how do you prove that these relations are enough? So this was the big theorem of Caddis, Kamitzer, and Morrison, um, very influential, um, which is that um, with just the relations I wrote on the previous page, uh, there, uh, this functor from Webb is defined as an equivalent of categories over the generic field, which is to say C adjoint Q or Q equals one at, over C. Um, so the easy part is to show that there is a functor. And Morrison did this in his thesis to show that these relations are satisfied after you apply the functor. That's fine. But then they use this huge trick for the rest, which is uh, something called skew how duality. I'm not really going to describe skew how duality to, to you. You know, normal sure while duality says that you have these two intertwining actions um, of, of two different uh, two different algebras on some kind of tensor product. And skew how duality is also an intertwining action of two different algebras on a big exterior product. And when you take an exterior product of a direct sum, then that becomes a sum of partial exterior products, and you end up with stuff like tensor products with fundamental representations inside it. So it's pretty well explained in their paper. If you care, I'm not going to go into more detail. But what what this what skew how duality implies is that if you take this item potented form of, of quantum GLM, um, then there's a map. There's a way for this to act on home spaces between m fold tensor powers of fundamental representations, um, where like one of these things might, you know, where the label, the labelings of these sequences correspond to sort of the weight spaces here. Um, so these are specific home spaces in my category of fundamental representations. But it turns out that. I can, if I allow myself to take L0, the trivial representation, then I can sort of extend anything to sequences of the same size. Um, so, so it's enough to understand these home spaces. Um, so then the first step is to argue that this morphism actually factors to the Webb's category. I mean, obviously, if fund is equivalent to Webb's, then, then, these, then, then all these morphisms should exist in Webb's, but so they explicitly lift um, this map to a functor to wet. So they tell you where the raising and the lowering operators in the quantum group go as maps between tensor products of fundamental representations. And so here, um, EI takes basically it's operating on the i an i plus first um, rung of the of the ladder to uh, to take L A tensor L B to L A plus one tensor L B minus one, which is kind of what you think about the i funda fundamental weight. Sorry, sorry, i the root doing it adds one to the i component and subtracts one from the i plus first component. You think about xi minus xi plus one. And fi does the opposite. And they show that the, that the relations of the quantum group are satisfied because of these relations in webs. So they have this functor. And so you have this um, commuting diagram of, of categories. And um, the fact that this is full from sure while duality implies that lambda is full. Um, so, so that's great. Um, but webs in theory might be much, much, much bigger. There might be many more relations. Sorry, there may be many more diagrams that are constructible out of trivalent vertices. How do you know that they'll all be in the image of these? In particular, anything in the image of these looks something like this, which this kind of diagram we call a ladder. Um, even though it would be, I don't know, it's more of like a Donkey Kong thing. It's not, uh, not really just a ladder, but um, nonetheless, one would need to prove that all lat webs are in the span of this in order for, for, for this to be surjective. And um, they, they do this, they, they, they prove this sort of ladderization process. It's kind of like a more theory argument that if you have some crazy diagram built out of trivalent vertices, that you can that you can straighten it into something which is in this nice form. Um, and then once once you have that, um, then the final statement is to, is to show that um, things aren't so big. But here they they knew what the kernel of of, uh, of phi was. In fact, they they 
I think that they proved this in the paper. I don't know if it was known before. It probably was though. Um, it's exactly generated by sort of the idempotents in this idempotent and quantum group that go to things that don't make sense here. There's all sorts of weights that that um, that don't correspond to objects, and and so it's obvious that those that those things go to zero in webs as well. So if you have a that means that there's a map from UQ modulo the kernel to webs. There's also a map to fund. Um, we know this is surjective by laterization. And so, so now you know that if you have a surjective map composed of something as an isomorphism, then, then everything inside is an isomorphism. Standard linear algebra. Any questions? So there's a this was a, a beautiful thing and, and uh, seemed, it made skew how duality seem like a really powerful tool because it solved this sort of long standing problem. Cooperberg back in the 90s had asked, can we find uh, diagrammatic descriptions of, of tensor products and fundamental representations? And, and it was you know, almost 20 years until the solution of, in the first case, type A. And so people wondered whether we could use similar tricks in other types. And this was explored pretty well by um, Sartori and Tubenhauer, who, who basically point out that. Um, that similar techniques just don't work in other types, or at least not so easily. So first off, uh, like what's dual to representation theory is not some other quantum group, but it's actually some co-ideal subalgebra. And, and so describing what's happening on that side is sort of also a difficult problem that would need to be solved before you could use these techniques. Um, there's another sort of drawback with what they do um, which is that this technique of skew-out duality sort of only worked over, over, the, over the field. The skew -out duality isn't sort of proven integrally. And there's other techniques that people use to study webs, such as sort of making these home spaces correspond to some homology groups or cycles in, 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 in affine Grassmannians um, using geometric satake. So Bruce Fontaine has some papers about this. But these sort of techniques sort of only work when you're, when you're over C. Um, and, and that means that applications to modular representation theory sort of aren't really approachable using these techniques. So when you have a category given by generators and relations, by definition, this gives you a, a, a version of that category to find over a small ring, the smallest ring containing all your coefficients, right? And in this case, and so when you have it to find over a small ring, then you can do lots of specializations like to various fields. And you can hope that this describes home spaces between tensor products of fundamental representations in other fields, which as I described, is, is they're all tilting modules. And this sort of basically describes the tilting modules. Um, so in this case, the smallest ring containing all the coefficients is Z adjoined QQ inverse, or Z if you're doing just normal GLM. But there's no proof from what Cotta Scanlon or Morrison do that this actually does give you the right answer over Z QQ inverse. So are we describing tilting modules or is this just some random algebra? If we specialize to find a characteristic, is this some random algebra or are we describing something else? Um, so um, in, in 2016, I came up with a new proof of Cato scan that's in Morrison's results, which doesn't use skew how duality and explicitly works over the integral form. And the way that we do it is by actually finding bases um, for, for home spaces and webs and actually arguing diagrammatically that you can reduce things to bases. It, 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 it took a lot of work. Um, so this style of proof uh, does generalize to many other things, but it is not a small amount of work and you can't do it in less than a hundred pages. I mean, it's painful. <laughs> um, whereas, um, uh, but we did, but I was able to prove that this integral form of webs does match um, tilting modules. So it really does describe what we care about, and this allows you to get information about modular representation theory from this. I'll mention that Cadiz, Kamitz, and Morrison had a lot of relations in their paper that they knew were redundant when working over C, but that they knew weren't redundant when working over the integers. And so they specifically left those relations in, and I'm very thankful for them. Um, otherwise, it, you know, coming up with all the relations would have been much more tricky. So this sort of, um, I'm, I'm now going to tell you about a different proof in type A that might work. So here is a proof, which 
um, which would make sense not over the integers, but would make sense so long as you inverted quantum numbers, just quantum numbers for k less than n. Or if you're in the classical setting, if you aren't in small characteristic. Um, so let me let me show you. It, it's basically the same outline, the same general idea, but it uses different tricks. So the main new trick that you have available when you're when you when you're working in um, not in small characteristic um, is that every fundamental representation is now a direct sum and of a tensor product of the standard representation. You know, so, ten, so exterior powers aren't always direct sum ends of tensor products. Um, in small characteristic, we all know that lambda two v is actually not a sum end of v squared and, and characteristic two. But um, if we if they are sum ends, and we don't have to study all tensor products of fundamentals, we can just study iterated tensor products of the standard representation, a category I might call standard one. And so it's enough to show that we have a. Uh, that our category of webs describes the right home spaces when um, going from one 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 to one 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 one. Um, that is that's sort of the main sort of cheat that you get by inverting these small quantum numbers. Well, now you've got sure while duality, which tells you instead of skew how duality, which tells you that there's a Heck algebra, which um, instead of a quantum group which acts by intertwiners on these tensor products. So the, the, the braiding, the, the quantum braiding on these things give you, gives you an action of the Heck algebra in this case. Um, and that these are all the intertwiners. So, um, so now we can try to imitate the same proof re replacing the quantum group with the Heck algebra. So first we wanna make the action of the Heck algebra factor through webs, which we can do by, by specifying what, what the braiding is basically. Um, and there's a formula explicitly given in, in, in Pattis, Gannon, and Morrison, and they don't check the braid relations. That's fine. That's not a problem. Um, the next thing you want to show is that every morphism, every web you could possibly construct going from 11111 to 11111. And remember, these webs go through all sorts of different crazy things. I, I can try to vertices, bring it all over the place. Um, but we need to show that every one of those can be reduced to something in the image of this Heck algebra. Laterization gives you a lot of that, um, but sort of there's this issue uh, when you're working with SLN instead of GLN, which makes it significantly harder. And one of, and, and Kevin Skinner and Morrison was working with SLN, which actually is a lot harder than GLN because now you've got orientations on everything because V is not isomorphic to its dual. You've got cups and caps, which identify which are maps from V tensor V dual to the identity, and basically you have this whole issue that really you can sort of reduce things to oriented tangles, but you'd then have to go a lot further to reduce it to braids and you'd have to use some, some like Reitermeister moves and, and crossing switches and various things like that. So it, it's sort of a, 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 it's like a, it's like a topological argument but where you have to work, where you have like the Reitermeister moves modular lower terms, things like that. Um, it, it, it's, it's pretty standard, but it, this kind of argument's not always in the literature. Uh, so I'm not saying this is hard, but I'm saying it would take a little bit of work. Um, and then the final step is that we actually do know the kernel of the map from the Heck algebra to the endomorphisms of CN tensor M. And it's uh, generated, if you think of the Heck algebra as being a big monoidal family of algebras, by um, a certain uh, casualistic basis element for the longest element in SN plus one, and the things that that generates inside of SN. So it's like projection to the sign wrap on and plus one strands. Um, and you want to check that this goes to zero in webs. So in fact, this cosmology basis element is really easy to describe in webs. In webs, this is literally just take a whole bunch of one strands, merge them, one, one, one and one merge to two, which merged to three, which merged to four. I've, I've sort of done that all in one step and had it all merged to n plus one. So just a big wedge product to the n plus first wedge power. And then coming out, but we also know in webs that the n plus first wedge power is already zero. So it's obvious that this, that, that, that this kernel of the Heck algebra is, goes to zero in webs. And then you have the exact same argument that you had before. Um, that, that this function is fully truthful. Well, I'm not saying that I've done this carefully or that we wrote it up. Um, such a proof would work 
but it's not significantly easier than Cato's Counters and Morrison's proof, so it's not really worth writing up. It is much easier than my proof, and it should work over this other field, uh, over this, sorry, other ring, although it's still not as good as the other proofs. Ben? Yes. There, there actually is a paper um, where they describe the ca this category of mm -hmm. tensor using those kinds of diagrams where you have all these strands that merge together. I think um, maybe by Adam Sikora. Okay, know? good. I'll have to look this up. So I think, yeah, something about something like this has been done in the living. Okay, period. that's good. That's good. Thanks, Orl. Um, okay, good. Um, so, well, I'm mentioning this because we do something very similar in type C, but there's an awful lot of complications that happen from type C uh, and simplifications as well. So, I'm prepping you for this. Any questions about type A before I move to type C? All right, so type C has a lot of little subtle differences, which kind of add up. Um, so now I'm going to let B be the standard representation of SP2N. It's no, the first major difference is that it's no longer true that the fundamental representations are exterior products. You've got this symplectic form on V, which basically gives you a copy of the trivial representation inside the second exterior object. Okay, and so if you take the second exterior algebra and you remove this, the, the trivial representation, then you get the second fundamental representation. And similarly, there's a copy of, of lambda one inside lambda three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the fundamental representations are some ends of the exterior product, um, but uh, they are not the exterior products anymore. Now, one interesting feature of what we proved, and I'm sure this has to have been known before, but I, I, we couldn't find it. So we define these maps in our type C category. And these are maps from tensor products of fundamentals, not from tensor products of exterior, not from exteriors, but from actual fundamentals. From Li tensor Lj to Li plus J. And these satisfy associativity. So that actually implies that the direct sum of all the fundamental representations is also an algebra. It only goes up to half the dimension because it only goes up to omega n of C to the 2n. Um, but nonetheless, it's an algebra. I don't know if this algebra is in the literature. Um, and so that's sort of a, a side effect of our results. It's kind of interesting, but we had to sort of prove that. Um, uh, I'll, I'll mention that I, I said before that exterior products, so when, you said, when you're passing to the quantum deformation, can you still talk about these exterior products? Well, as I said, exterior products make sense. We, we were looking in the literature, it should be there, but like, I, I don't know. I couldn't find the spot that said that the exterior product was the same size as the normal exterior product because you don't know that for sure. I'm uh, pretty sure it's true. Anyway. Okay, so the second issue is that fundamental representations are not always tilting. And um, they are tilting if and only if all quantum numbers are invertible from one to n. So here's sort of a, a general philosophical principle which is that if you're just trying to find out what, find, trying to find a nice presentation by generators and relations of a category, all of the objects you use should be tilting if you want this to be a flat presentation. Um, because otherwise you know that the behavior and the size of Hanks spaces are gonna change if you specialize to find a character to, to some characteristic. So you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be able to specialize to any characteristic. Um, where the behavior of your objects changes and where the size of home spaces can change if you're going to have a flat presentation. Um, in particular, that means that you should invert anything that you need to invert. You'll be forced to invert anything that you need to invert for that to be true. Um, so you may note, uh, I'll, I'll go back at some point to the, um, oh, maybe I can do this. No, 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 hold on. I can always zoom back like this. Uh, you'll note that there are some denominators here in this presentation. So n plus one is not a denominator because it's canceled by the two n plus two in the numerator, but you've got some denominators here and here. And, and, and these denominators, you just can't get rid of. Um, this algebra does not have a form over Z2, Q inverse, it just has a form um, over this slightly bigger ring uh, where all this ring that I was calling K before where all the quantum low number quantum numbers are invertible. So we are essentially forced to work over this 
extension of ZQ inverse. And because we're over this extension, then we have this fact that now or, uh, fundamental representations are some ands of tensor products of the standard representation. So this like restricting to standard representations isn't cheating anymore. It's not like a dirty trick anymore. We're forced into this situation, so we might as well use the trick. Um, so let's let's sort of try following the previous outline to prove that um, that we have a, a equivalence of categories to fundamental representations. Well, the zero, the negative first step, the easy step I said from before is to check that the relations sat are satisfied after applying. Um, Lambda. Um, well, unfortunately, actually, we don't even have a formula for lambda yet. <laughs> we do for small values of n, and hopefully, we'll finish that little part of the, part of the project soon. Um, but finding these formulas is actually surprisingly complicated. Um, so at q equals one, it's not so bad, but but with the q's, it's 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 a little bit annoying. So to give you an idea of why this is trickier, um, so the, the second so. The standard base, the standard representation as a basis, it's a two n dimensional vector space. I'm going to parameterize the basis by e one through e n and e negative one through e negative n. And um, and so inside the second exterior space, you now have a pretty high dimensional space in in the zero weight space. So the weight of e to the i. Oh, I'm gamma lambda dyslexic. Thank you, Dirty. Uh, if I say gamma, I mean lambda. And if I say lambda, I mean gamma. Sorry. Um, so uh, e, e to the i is in the opposite weight space from e to the minus i. So e to the minus i tensor e i is in degree is in weight space zero. And so you have this very high space in, in weight space zero. And then to get the second fundamental representation, you have to subtract a trivial representation from that. And this trivial representation is is up to powers of q. It's like E1 tensor E minus one plus E2 tensor E minus two plus E3 tensor E minus two. It's some annoying linear combination. So to get um, to get a, a basis, well, there's many bases I could choose. It's not obvious that there's one basis that's going to be nicer than any other basis. And in fact, there's two bases that are nicer than any other bases: the good basis and the co-good basis, to use technical terms. Um, and one of these is adapted to this multiplication map. So the multiplication map does really obvious things, and the, it sends e i tensor e minus i to, you know, something that you'd expect. Um, but it's poorly adapted. The formulas involving this map are in, in that basis are are really awful. And then vice versa, there's a basis that's good for this and is annoying for this, and there's a change of basis matrix which is like a Cartan matrix. Um, so um, already you can see that that coming up with the formulas is a little bit more complicated. Um, for I know the formula is for wedge two, but for wedge wedge k, I, I we haven't yet figured it out. Uh, that should be coming pretty soon. Um, none. So how do we prove that there's a functor then? <laughs> I, I, like how do we even construct a functor in the first place if we don't know which maps our generators are going to? Well, actually, we use dirty tricks, and these are the same dirty tricks that people who are diagrammaticians use all the time anyway. Just not usually in the proof. Uh, usually just in the notebook before we write the paper. So for instance, you know that there's a one dimensional space of maps from L1 tensor L1 to L2, because you know the size of Hom spaces in the representation category. So there is some map up to scalar, we can call it this. Because of the size of Hom spaces, you know that certain relations exist in a certain general form, but you may not know what the coefficients are. But then certain things you do know. You know the dimension of the, the standard representations. That can't change by doing any renormalization of cups and caps. You know the, the value of the ribbon elements on various things. Once you fix your pivotal structure, that can't change. And using these things at various consistency checks between these things, we determine what the braiding is, and we determine all the coefficients and the relations as the only things that are possible. So that's how we. We deduce that there's a functor existing without actually even finding a formula for that functor. Nonetheless, in the examples we've done so far, these coefficients appearing in the relations are actually natural things that are counting stuff. <laughs> it's not the worst thing in the world. It, you know, in examples, it, it's not nonsense. But, uh, we haven't really figured out the So that was a fair bit of hard work. And this was modeled on previous work of, of uh, David Rose and Logan Tatham, who did the case of type C3. Um, 
So as I said, we're, we, we've inverted small quantum numbers. We can reduce the tensor products of the standard representation. And now, instead of Sherwell duality, we have the type C analog, which is Brouwer Sherwell duality. So there's this um, BMW algebra, which surjects onto the endomorphisms of the nth power of V. But because of the cups and caps now that exist, there's also Hans between different tensor powers of V, say from the identity to V tensor squared. And so you can put them all together and include the cups and caps in this Brouwer category. Um, and of course, this factors through web, which you can show by finding the crossings and finding the cups and caps and checking that the relations are satisfied. And, and once, once you know that the Brouwer thing, which, which is full onto, onto standard rep, uh, factors through webs, that tells you that the function from webs is full as well. But there's trouble brewing for the rest of the proof. So at the end, we wanted to show that webs was not too big. Um, and we did this by showing that the kernel of the map from, you know, so you would want to show this by showing that the kernel of the map from Brouwer to Fund is the same as the kernel of the map from Webbs to Fund, or at least um, is, con is, is contained in the, sorry, is contained in the map from Brouwer to Webbs, the kernel of the map from Brouwer to Webbs. Um, but we don't know what that kernel is. So the kernel, um, unlike before, where it was just some nice cosmolistic basis element or something, People understood it. It's known by sort of work of Wei Zhang and more explicitly by work of Ruby Westbury that this is that there is just one more relation you have to one relation that's uh, you need to kill in the Brouwer category to get to to get down to um, fund, and it's the quantum Fafian. But writing that explicitly in terms of of crossings and cups and caps and so forth, there's no known closed formula as far as I or as far as we could find, nor did we find one. Um, the way that we get around this is actually, and, and I, I think this is one of the real advantages of webs as opposed to these other descriptions, BMW categories, Brouwer categories. So I, I've, I always advocate for studying fun rather than standard rep. Yes, everything is a sum and of tensor products of the standard representation if you invert things, but that actually is worse for a number of reasons. One is that there's sort of too many sum ends that appear at once when you take high powers of V, so you can't isolate them as, as much as you want to. It doesn't necessarily give you an object adapted cellular category in the nice way you want it to. Um, that's one story which I won't have time to talk about. But another reason that Webs is better is because it makes for very explicit and easy descriptions of these kernels. So here's the kernel um, descri described in terms of Webs. It's exactly like it was in type A. Okay, it, it, in type A, um, uh, sort of, the uh, this morphism here, you can rewrite this in terms of the Brouwer, Brouwer category. And this is exactly the thing, which is the kernel. But we know it's zero because by, by already by one of our relations, the strand labeled M plus one is zero. Um, so, so basically what we do is we use some sort of ladderization style arguments, although it's a different kind of thing. It's more of like a right meister style arguments. Um, to argue that everything is in the image of the Brouwer category. And, um, and then we pass to the field and we use a dimension count to say that, okay, we know that this is zero. We know that this imposes some completely unknown relation on the Brouwer category, but we know enough facts about the, what that relation would be that we can deduce that the size is reduced from all possible, you know, like, tangles to, to, to sort of n plus one avoiding planar matchings, which I can describe, but I don't have to. But anyway, we sort of we use sort of this known fact here to, to, to argue that the, the size um, is not too big. Um, but we have to work over the field because we're using dimension counts, basically saying, oh, it's full and the dimension is not bigger, so it must be injective. I didn't explain that well. You'll have to forgive me. Um, I'll also mention that we use not directly the, the Brouwer algebra, the BMW algebra, but we use a, a variant, which is a little bit easier to work with in many ways, also harder to work with in many ways. So um, these categories are use the braiding um, as sort of their generating map from V1 tensor V1 to V1 tensor V1. And we use a, a sort of a different map, which happens to be rotation invariant. 
we see the braiding is rotation invariant if and only if the overcrossing is equal to the undercrossing, which happens at q equals one. And so people have used sort of crossing diagrams rather than over and undercrossing diagrams for classical type for a while. But, but Q deforming that is hard. And so when people Q deform, they usually Q deform and say, oh, the braiding's not symmetric anymore. I should use over and under crossings. But we found a, a rotation invariant for valent vertex um, that allows us to use some of the same topological arguments with um, singular braids that are just a little bit easier to work with. So using this, this for valent vertex, you can also try to come up with a presentation of this alternate Brouwer algebra. Um, the relations are a little bit nastier. You, you don't have uh, right Meister 2 on the nose. You actually got some nasty lower terms. Uh, you don't have right Meister 3 on the nose. You've got something a little funkier. Um, but, but regardless, um, this thing, uh, sorry. And, and of course, you've got some mystery relation. Whatever the image of n plus 1 is, when described in terms of these four valent vertices, we know it exists. We don't know what it is but this should be zero. And you put all these things together and this algebra um, is, should be, you know, it should, is equivalent to a, this endomorphism algebra, which means um, tensor products of V. And you'll note that this presentation um, actually is straight up integral. So this should give a nice integral presentation once you show that this has only integral coefficients, which it does in, in the example two. Um, if you're really interested in finding a, 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 an integral form for tilting modules, then, then this should be it. Why is that duplicated? Okay. Um, so we, I just showed you a proof with a whole bunch of hacks and a whole bunch of cheats. Um, and in the next paper, um, which is going to be significantly longer, we plan on, on filling in all the gaps. We want to give an explicit example here, a proof that works over the integral form. Um, lots and lots of extra formulas that are like the extra formulas Travis Kamnitzer gave that sort of explain how to reduce diagrams. And more importantly, an explicit basis of morphisms that makes us into a nice cellular category. So I want to talk about that now because this relates to the computation of local intersection forms, which is one of the main connections with modular representation theory. So what is a light lattice? When lambda is a very dominant weight, so here's a general fact about representations of a semi-simple Lie algebra. When lambda is very dominant and I tensor with any representation, this splits into a direct sum of the irreducibles where I take lambda and I shift it by a weight of V. And I'm viewing V as a, a, a multi-set with the weights of V as a multi-set. So if you fix a given, so if you fix a given mu and let lambda vary, I can sort of tensor with L nu for some other dominant weight and sort of go from the space of, of projection maps here from L lambda tensor V to L lambda plus nu to the space of, of, of projection maps here after I've added nu to lambda. And this allows me to study what happens when lambda is small. So this map exists whenever lambda and mu are both dominant. But so for instance, if lambda is not, not very, if lambda is not especially dominant relative to mu, uh, then, then um, it's possible that this is not a sum and. And so this home space could be zero dimensional. But as I make it more and more dominant, the home space will only increase and increase and increase. And in fact, this is an injection. So if you sort of take the limit of this, you're describing the mu weight space of V in some sense. Uh, so eventually, as lambda is dominant enough, this stabilizes to an isomorphism, if only because it's an injective map and they both have the same dimension equal to the dimension of, of the mu weight space of V. So if you're interested in constructing projection maps, then one thing you could start at is by looking sort of at the minimal places where the dimension jumps and construct those projection maps. And then all the projection maps in here will be images of the ones here. This is the philosophy of light ladders. So um, light ladders are these minimal projections sort of uh, lifted to this diagrammatic category. 
Let me give an example because it's very clarifying. So let's work in type A. V is going to be the standard representation of GLN. And the weights are just all the places you can put one and, 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 and Z to the N. And if you write this as a linear combination of fundamental representations, it's the fourth fundamental representation minus the third fundamental representation. So if I take a dominant weight, which is a positive linear combination of these things, when is it true that when I add mu, I will get another dominant weight? Well, I better have A3 be positive because I don't want to have a negative coefficient when I add them together. And it turns out that that's exactly the criterion for which this to be is, is a sum. In this, in this minuscule case. So the smallest lambda for which lambda plus mu, the mu for this mu is a sum end of L lambda tensor V is when lambda is omega three. And in that case, lambda plus mu is omega four. So for this minimal example, I want to map from L, from the third fundamental representation, tensor V to the fourth fundamental representation. And look, it's right there. We have that already. Now for any other example for which this is a sum and A3 will be positive. And so I can sort of think that L lambda is a sum and of L nu tensor uh, omega L3. And L lambda plus mu is a sum and of L nu tensor omega four. And so I can just take the identity map of L nu and then I induce it by doing some projection and projection maps on top and bottom to get sort of the desired map. Okay, so basically this is the prototype, it's the pattern from which all other projections can be constructed. Let me do another example. So here is a, a mu in, I guess, one, two, three, four, five, ones, five, zeros. So this is in GL10. And mu is in the fifth fundamental representation because it has five ones. And if you describe this as a linear combination of fundamental representations, it's the 10th, which accounts would give you ones everywhere, minus the nines. Oh, now you just, this, just have this one. And then eighth minus seven contributes this one. Fifth minus third contributes these two ones, and so forth. And the minimal lambda for which lambda plus mu is dominant is all the minus signs, because we need to cancel them out and make them positive. And then when I add mu, I get all the plus signs. So I want to map from uh, sort of L1 tensor L3 tensor L7 tensor L9 to L2 tensor L5 tensor L8 tensor L10, but I also need a tensor with V. And it turns out you can just draw this thing built up out of trigonal vertices and it works. So this thing, after you compose the appropriate projection maps, gives you, gives you, uh, gives you your projection that you care about. And moreover, the one, these diagrams that I've drawn are all in webs. They're all defined integrally. They exist in the integral form of your pathway. So your local intersection form is basically determining whether L lambda plus mu actually is a sum and of L lambda tensor B, say after you specialize to a finite field. So you've got a one-dimensional space of inclusions and a one-dimensional space of projections. And when you compose them, you're going to get some multiple of the identity map. But what multiple of the identity map? OK. The, what multiple of the identity map you get depends on sort of what rescaling of these maps you use. But there aren't that many rescalings that live inside the integral form. OK. And so sort of the ideal generated by this thing inside the integral form is an invariant. And um, so, oh, so under the assumption, um, oh, I, I think I miswrote that, but under the assumption, yeah, yeah, under the assumption that L lambda is tilting, if you want to know whether the tilting of lambda plus mu is inside this, it's, it's exactly equivalent to this being invertible after specialization. So the local intersection form is in some sense the first line of defense in modular representation theory. It tells you when things, when things um, split off. And then the first time something goes wrong, it tells you why it goes wrong. But eventually, uh, this condition stops holding and it stops being incredibly useful. Although, in some sense, it's really the input to, to Jordy's computer programs and, and, and uh, in some sense, um, and, and, and Torga's computer programs. And, and, and if you know all the local intersection forms, you basically know what you need to know to crank the category. You just don't have the combinatorics to understand what's going on. Um, 
since I'm out of time, I'm just going to mention that I have a conjectural formula for these local intersect conforms um, in terms of ratios of quantum numbers, which looks kind of like the wild dimension formula, but isn't. And I would love for an explanation of that. And I was just going to say that in type C, and I'll explain for anyone who cares, we've got the same set of ideas. So we've got, um, we know how to define the, the light loops. We don't, we, we know how to define the light loops. Um, I'll say one or two other things. So um, in type C2, Elijah, a student, studied light weaves and, and local intersection forms. And he generalized my type A conjecture to extremal weights um, inside the fundamental representations. There's also sort of non-extremal weights and he found formulas for those non-extremal weights. Um, and he's doing the same thing right now in type G2 with um, uh, Haihan Wu at UC Davis. Um, so there's reasonable uh, combinatorial answers now for, for a lot of these local intersections. But there's still a lot of mistakes. Um, another application of type C webs is that um, recently, majority you can use them to prove uh, geometric sotake and quantum geometric sotake in type C. So, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Let's thank Ben for the really great talk. Um, I have a really small question. The colors in the diagrams, they don't, are they meaningful or? I was trying to make it, I, know, I was adding labels as well, but I was trying to say like blue is always one and purple is always K plus one or something. I probably failed at some point. Okay, cool. Does anyone have any questions for Ben? The colors in the thank you is not meaningful. <laughs> the thank you is meaningful. Hey, Ben. Hi, Joel. Uh, great talk. Um, are you sure that the skew hal duality does, approach doesn't work over integrally? I mean, I'm not I never, sure that it doesn't work. I never integrally. tried, but I, uh, what, <laughs> like, what makes the sure wild duality approach more likely to work than the skew hal duality? I just, I know that there's all these results about, about these things. Like, I, I know where to cite that even. But but I, I have no idea where to set anything else you have to So I'm not sure that doesn't work. Okay. It certainly hasn't been, it hasn't been it's not in the literature. And is it but is, is it true? I mean like like for instance a a, a size two rung if you have divided powers, if you have enough suitable divided powers. Then it should work. You, you really need divided powers. And my other question is under the uh, this geometric satake, maybe not not quantum geometric satake, just ordinary geometric satake. What 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 do these uh, local intersection forms become, or what are they expressed in? Right. Um, I mean, these become sort of homes between uh, sort of. You take an IC sheaf and you tensor with another IC sheaf and you take HOM to a third IC sheaf and compose these things. But this transforms. Okay, so it's, it's tensoring with the standard representation is usually like some kind of induce and restrict. Um, probably, Jordy, you can probably answer this better than me, but it, it is some local intersection form with some stock somewhere after you push forward to a parabolic. Um, like if you don't have any, um, like let's say you're doing fundamentals for GLN, then right. this is really like a um, intersecting cycles in some um, fibers of a convolution map. In type C, I think it's more complicated though because the fundamental representations are weirder. Yeah, as soon as you have idempotents around, it's like some analog of this with ICs, but. So just to clarify that point about the um, BMW algebra and the Lera Zhang yes. work. So the point is that we explicit, so we have this map from the BMW algebra to 
endomorphisms of some tensor product of fundamentals mm -hmm. type C. And yep. we know that the kernel is generated by some element that we can write down as some quantum Fafian or something. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends but what you issue, mean by you can write down. Like if, if you allow me to do things with representations, um, I can tell you what this map is. Oh no, what, what, what does it mean? But so, so the point, like the point is that there's some element that you know exists in the BMW algebra, but you kind of have no formula for it. Is that the? Yeah. And it was even very hard to show that this, this element, because and in that Leather Jung paper, they worked very hard to show that this element spans the kernel. No. Right. Kernel. Yeah, we actually don't need to work very hard. Um, we don't need to use any of their results, uh, but yeah. Like we just need to observe that, um, that uh, whatever this element is, it's basically the half twist plus lower terms when described in, in our tetravalent language. And, and using that and some other sort of topological arguments, you know that the size of home spaces and webs is at most the number of n plus one avoiding planar matchings, which by the result of Sundaram is exactly the dimension that you need in fun. So you have now have dimension that is at most something, but it has maps by, by a full map, to the full functor to the thing where the dimension is exactly that. So yes, I should mention these nice results of Sundaram, which calculate the size of these home spaces in type C. So Ben, if it, if instead what I what I want is like a a diagrammatic description of the category of tilting objects, uh, like how how far away from that is this, and like what what are the the no no this is the right an, this is the right answer. This but you have the, this uh, oh of all tilting objects yeah of all of all tilting objects. Right. So, so there's like, there's like a couple steps involved in, in sort of up, upgrading this, right? Um, formally, all you need to do is find uh, all the clasps. So these are, this is the fancy word for the idempotence projecting to the tilting module inside the, um, in, inside the tensor product of fundamental representation. So in characteristic zero, these are usually called clasps. Um, they're the generalizations of jones wenzel projectors for the complete algebra. And characteristic P, or you know, like quantum groups of written for unity. I don't know what they, you know, they K clasps where K is your ground field or something. Um, finding those recursive formulas for these things in uh, for generic Q or you know, semi-simple setting, um, it's exactly the same problem as finding these local intersection forms. So if you can compute these local intersection forms, you have recursive formulas for clasps so that you can see that in my White ladders class conductive paper on type A. Um, so I gave an explicit formula for class in terms of these local intersection forms. Um, in in modular representation theory, I mean it's 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 extremely difficult, of course. Uh, uh, so Burrell Lebedinsky Plaza sort of you say, oh, if you know all the local intersection forms and you know how things do, it, you can sort of figure out um, how to find these. P Jones Wenzel projectors, they just do type that's a, just type A1. But okay, so that's just the first step. Now then once you have item puts, you can formally add item puts to a category using the Kirby envelope construction. And then you get tilting modules. But that doesn't mean that you can necessarily use this. You'd also like to have a whole bunch of other relations. Like you tensor product to two tilting modules has another tilting of the summit. You'd like to have those maps. And, and this is like the same as computing certain uh, whatever symbols. And that's also a hard problem. It's like quintuple class expansion formulas. I, I guess what I also want to know about is so you, you have these uh, these quantum numbers that you need to invert, right? But like that might be an unacceptable condition for me. If I, yeah, so if I care right. about, you know, symplectic groups in positive characteristic where now, you know, N is much larger than P. Uh, 
like I I don't I don't want to have to invert those things. Right. In that case, you'd you'd want to use you'd want to use this as you'd want to use the Brower the the BMW algebra Brower category uh, or this as yet undetermined um, quotient of our category. Um, again, like the problem with that is that no one knows this relation explicitly, um, but. You, you would like V is always tilting. All the other fundamental representations are not always tilting. You just have to use tensor powers of V. That's your only hope. There's a reason that these categories are much more complicated than, than web categories. So if there are further questions for Ben, maybe we'll move to this gather town to discuss more. Jordy pasted the link in the chat. And otherwise, I think the next talk is in a half hour. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Ben. <laughs>